We are in a revolution. But it is a revolution in which the side that fires the first shot loses. We will not fire any shots because our weapon is uncommon good sense. Good day and welcome to the Track the Time podcast brought to you by Acres USA, the voice of eco-agriculture. We have a special episode today, our 28th in the series that will feature a friend and guest to Acres USA, Dr. Paul Deboff. A special thanks to our series sponsors, BCS America and Albert Lee Seed, who make this all possible. Uh, but boy, are we excited about this one. Uh, Dr. Paul Deloff, he spent 50 years in large animal veterinary practice. He's worked with farmers all over the world to help them think differently. He was way ahead of his time pushing grass as cattle feed in the 70s and 80s. He was working with holistic proven tools that operate completely independent of the technology booms happening today. So he is an amazing resource. His new hardcover book, A Guide to Raising Animals Organically, has captured his lifetime of work in a comprehensive way. We're very proud to be the publisher of his book. It's available now. If you like his uh, talk today and you want to learn more, I can't recommend uh, a more valuable resource than that book. Um, if you want to hear more uh, from him in person, he's also going to be talking at our conference in December in Minneapolis. He's going to be doing a full session of EcoAg U on soil for cattle, cattle feed systems, and we'll even allow folks to peek inside his vet bag. Um, and the last time we had him talk was 2007, so this is rare. We really wanted to share that talk with our audience today because it's really the story of Dr. Paul, how he discovered his line of work, how he became a veterinarian, how he discovered organic along the way, how he helped champion the growth and rebirth of these old veterinary tools so important to sustainable and organic farmers. So here's Dr. Paul's talk from 2007 titled Enhancing Vet Tools. It's more than just a story about livestock, I promise you that. It's a story about how we treat animals, and how those animals can feed our farming ecosystems with our help, of course. So here's Dr. Paul. Can you hear me in back? I can normally talk quite loud. Uh, welcome. It's uh, nice to see uh, quite a few familiar faces here and some new ones. Um, I'm going to talk today on the uh, three major reasons why sometimes these veterinary tools don't work, and I will be going through the tools. I have had an interesting journey in my veterinary career. Uh, I'm now past my 40th year as a veterinarian, and for some of you that don't know my background, I'll preface it a little bit, in that I was a large animal veterinarian right out of school in 1967 in western Minnesota, where every driveway had cows, and I entered the entered veterinary medicine when everybody pretty much fed their cows grass and I went into uh, high forage diets, uh, cows that weren't pushed and a lot of my clients were organic in 67 and didn't know it because we hadn't been there yet. And I had the good fortune from 67 on up through the 90s to see the pendulum swing way over. American agriculture for the 70s and 80s was a period of time where everybody sat on the edge of their chairs waiting for the next technological advancement to come out of industry, and you jumped on it. And I was, I was the head of the pack in that one. I had a five-man practice in western Wisconsin. We had the largest practice for probably the western third of Wisconsin, and uh, we jumped on everything. When Jenison came out, we were there. When Chloramphenicol came out. When they introduced dry cow mastitis tubes, we were there. And we did a blitzkrieg in sales. We were really good at it. I left my corporate five-man practice and in the early 80s decided to go into practice just on my own to be a large animal veterinarian and work with cows. That was my expertise. I, was, I felt as very good at it. And I had over a period of a number of years in the late 80s and early 90s, I watched 25 dairy farmers come from the conventional paradigm and go into organic. And I had a very good soils man in my practice, a Midwest Bioag consultant who convinced me to go listen to Midwest Bioag, Gary Zimmer and his crew, and I became a much better veterinarian when I got into agronomy. Then uh, I started these, uh, my first experience with an organic cow was in 1988. I drove into a farm. On a July day, registered herd, best herd in my practice, and this gentleman had a cow, big, white, valuable cow that had twins. And if you dairymen know what happens to a cow's body condition when she has twins, it disappears. 
plus, huge placenta hanging out, and she'd rolled the end of her one teeth, and she had a coliform mastitis in her right front quarter, and she wanted to die. 107 temperature, heart rate of 100. It was a type of cow that, as a conventional veterinarian, you'd throw the kitchen sink at. As I walked in the barn, I had a standard greeting for a lot of my clients. When I'd walk in, I'd say, hello, what's new? And as I said that to this client, I said, you know, hi, what's new? And he said, I'm certified organic. First time I had heard that phrase. And I said, good. I walked down to this cow, gave her a physical, and I was leaning over my bag to just take my arm in it and hit her. And he said, do you know what certified organic means, doc? And I said, nope, I don't have a clue. He said, well, that means you can't use antibiotics in this cow. And I got all these good antibiotics. And you can't use banamine. Uh, you can't use oxytocin. Uh, he happened to be working with Organic Valley that does not allow oxytocin. Oxytocin is allowed by the NOP, but Organic Valley is always taking the high road. And he kept listing what I couldn't use, and I kept backing up and backing up, and I had no tools for that man. Go to the next slide there, honey. Um, in 1988, these tools were completely unheard of. Veterinary medicine had lost them. Now, these tools were known in the early 1900s. This was veterinary medicine, and a lot of these things were human medicine. But we became corporatized, and we learned in veterinary school, if you've got a foot rot, you give 5 milligrams of tetracycline per pound, and you got a bottle with 100 milligrams of CC, and you took and figured it out, and so you give her X number of CCs. I mean, we were, we were, were dosing men. And so... I gave that cow a bottle, of, a bottle of glucose and saline and drove away. I was of no help. And I had, he had, this soils man had been working with his neighbors and clients, and I could see a, quite a bunch of my good farmers were going to go organic. And so I either had to flush them and say, I don't want to go there, or jump in and help them. I jumped in and helped them. First thing I read about was aloe vera. I got a book by Dr. Stephen Davis called The Scientific Validation of Aloe Vera. This guy lived, ate, drank, slept. If you were a white rabbit or a white rat, you did not want to be around this guy because he was going to do something to you to see what aloe vera would do. <laughs> and I read what aloe vera does, and it heals epithelial tissue. Kills bacteria. It does 15 things, and I thought, wow, this is dynamite for the inside of a cow's uterus. So I started playing around with aloe vera in the cow's uterus. And then I started reading, I read a book on tincturing. And I said, man, I've got a tincture. And I read a book on garlic. There's 35 antibiotics, 35 known antibiotics in garlic. There's a book out here in this table up here. It's called Herbal Antibiotics by Stephen Buhner from Vermont. And he lists the 35 plants and tinctures that kill bacteria. When I read that book, I thought, why didn't I know this? Why did I have to wait 25 years to find this out? So I started tincturing garlic. And then I put garlic with the aloe vera. And then I found a plant you could tincture that would squeeze the uterus down. It was known before, before we were here. It's called blue cohosh. It's called squaw ruts. And Native American females with childbirth problems would chew the root of this plant and it would release a huge estrogen dose and you have huge uterine contractions. Where do I want huge uterine contractions in veterinary medicine? With a cow with a retained placenta. We would normally give her prostaglandin and so I decided let's, let's put this cow on blue cohosh tincture, fill her uterus with aloe and garlic and see what happens. They came as good if not better than anything I'd ever tetracycline. And so that sort of became my, my step into organics. Uh, let's just go through these briefly. Uh, there's no excuse. Uh, I work as a consultant for Organic Valley, and we have now have 40, 60 percent of my time I spend with Organic Valley, and we have 40 dairy pools in America that we are procuring milk from. And I will be heading to Louisiana, Mississippi here shortly because we have a new little pool. And these these farmers down there, when they first start organics and don't know these tools, they operate by neglect, and that we do not want. In today's society, the people buying Organic Valley milk or Horizon milk or anybody's milk do not want their animals treated by neglect. And so we have to be very cognizant of this. The very first people that came in to organics in the, in the middle to late 80s didn't know these. And a tincture, what is a tincture? A tincture was uh, from biblical times. 
It's when you take a biomass, a plant, and you soak it in a liquid and molecules come out of that plant into the liquid. The most common thing is, is an alcohol base. Actually, I started out early with brandy because it was cheap and I'd be tincturing and I'd get to nipping and my wife could smell it on me. So then we went to vodka. <laughs> and now we've gone, this whole thing, these tools have all gone through a maturation process. Now most of your tinctures are in organic grain alcohol. And so we've come a long ways, baby, on a lot of these. So you'll see all these tinctures upstairs and wonder what they're for. The dairy farmers know, and that's part of my job at Organic Valley, is to bring these new people on the truck and say, hey, we've got, a, we've got a plethora of tools. And there's a whole bunch of books, as Fred mentioned. I have a book in its second edition. Uh, Stu, Hugh Caraman from Pennsylvania has a beautiful book uh, that Acres publishes. Uh, uh, Dr. Edgar Schaefer has a book on homeopathy. Jerry Bernetti and Hugh Caraman collaborated on a book. They have a, a, have a CD and a video. So when I go into an area, I say, you know, all you guys got to do is start reading and do your homework. I mean, the tools are now out there. The knowledge has been amassed since the late 80s. We've come a long ways. So there's a tincture for just about everything. And we give tinctures sublingual, under the tongue. They have to be absorbed in a mucous membrane. My mucous membranes are drying out from talking. Or the most user-friendly place that we put tinctures in the dairy world because cows are not head friendly and we have a lot of parlors in that is that anything that has had a heat and has gone through estrus the vaginal lining is like a mucous membrane and so 90 percent of the tinctures in organic valley and horizons dairy pools are given in the vulva in the parlor or in the barn and you do it with a little three cc syringe with a little pipe pad on it and it's very user friendly they don't even flinch and you just put that in the vulva. And you got to get it up over the pelvic brim, and it works slick as can be. Um, so if this was a tough one for Detloff to swallow, because I was conventional for 25 years, and I was used to large dosages. The first cow that I had with foot rot that I gave three cc's of garlic tincture to, I had my tongue in my cheek. I think, I wonder if this is going to work, because I really wanted to give her 20. And maybe 25 if it was really bad. And then we'll do it again. I mean, and that's the paradigm. Uh, our, whole, our whole mentality in the 70s and 80s was always big. Big is better. How, much, how many bushels of corn? How many ton of alfalfa? How quick can you get a pig to market in that? And so I was on this big paradigm. So if three cc's of this is good, let's nail her with seven or eight. And I kept reading the literature, one to three cc's. And I had to prove this to myself that three cc's and we're, we're dealing with tinctures and homeopathy. There was a whole new world out there that I learned in, from the agronomy section and that we're dealing with energies. We're not dealing with mass numbers of molecules. When you get into this arena here, and Kerry Reams, uh, educate, I, from uh, Dr. Scow, who's sitting here and that, I learned a whole lot. And when you learn the Reams soil method, all of a sudden you understand tinctures and homeopathy. Little light bulbs come on. So I can say there's a tincture for just about everything. You take and tincture. Uh, there's a product out there where you tincture seven plants that are all hormone laden. Uh, red clover blossoms have four estrogens in them. Wild yam root has DHEA, which is a precursor for testosterone and progesterone. And we have cows on monoculture diets now. And when you're on a monoculture diet, my clients for 20 years fed their cows corn, corn silage, alfalfa hay, and soybeans. I've got this old book from 1917, this old wisdom. I just love it. I opened up this book. I bought it in uh, Casanova, New York. It cost me $100 for this big old leather-bound book. It's, it's pristine. And it said, you realize... This was common knowledge in 1917. You realize that the bovine ruminant would like to eat a hundred plants every five days. A hundred different plants every five days. Two days later, I'm driving out of the driveway of my 425 cow herd that is my biggest client because he's pushed the envelope and I'll tell you what the problem is there in a minute. And I look at and I say, I wonder what those cows are eating. Well, they're on corn silage, 
They're on dried shell corn. They're on alfalfa hay. They're on haylage. And they get some soybean meal. And that was the paradigm for dairying in the Midwest. Corn, soybeans, and alfalfa hay. Learn how to grow it. Learn how to store corn silage. And so my cows are eating three to five plants. They might get a weed once in a while in the alfalfa. If they don't get the, if they're on the ball spraying, if the sprayer doesn't work, we get those weeds. You know. Anyway, uh, what are they missing? A whole 97 phytohormone mixes. These plants have phytohormones. And so it's, it's, that's why our conception rate has gone from 80 to 20 in America today. We don't have the normal phytohormones coming through this 100 plant diet. So anyway, tinctures are the longer people stay in organics. Now, I've been going to different pools. I'm on my sixth year in a lot of areas. And as I introduce, homeopathy and tinctures were unheard of in the Midwest in the early 90s. When I came in upon the scene, they said, wow, is this guy out of the box? And now when I go back to these areas six, seven years, their whole kit, I mean, they've got homeopathy, they've got tinctures, and they're using them daily. Now, you want to look upon these tools, I tell everybody, these are Band-Aids. If I come back here in five years, and I told this group in Kentucky, I was in uh, down by Hopkinsville, Kentucky on Wednesday for Organic Valley, and if I come back here in five years and you guys are all heavy users of this, you're doing something wrong. Because when I go to a pool, I tell them the first veterinary dollar you spend is on calcium in the soil. I talked to a bunch of Amish farmers down in in, uh, Kentucky, and we had 20-some guys that are transitioning. We've only got four guys on the truck, 20 transitioning, and another 100 sitting there that are looking at it. And I said, you guys got a three-year trip to get on our truck, and while you're on our trip... You probably better learn how to use these because you don't have good soils and good forage and you're going to have to band-aid yourself through. And I put on these barn meetings every year in these pools and I, we usually pick somebody that's kind of an old pro for the barn meeting. And the first question I'll ask, I'll say, what's your oldest cow in the barn here? And these guys that have been organic 10, 12 years will say, well, I've got one that's 18 years old or 17 years old. All of a sudden, we're getting a whole group of teenagers if you feed them right and if you got good soils. So, uh, tinctures are really becoming widely used. They're becoming our industry is maturing so that you, we have a lot of good tincture manufacturers out there. Uh, homeopathy. This is a tough one for veterinarians to swallow because uh, this is, gets into the energies. And what happens with the homeopathy is that you take the liquid mother tincture and you put it on a little sugar pill. And that will, that will absorb the molecules, but it will also absorb the energies. And I don't have enough time to go into the energies of the cations and anions of the electron and, the, and, and that, but that's what it boils down to. When you get into reams and the soils, all of a sudden it totally explains homeopathy. I will say this, there are about 60 homeopathy, uh, homeopathy things that we use in veterinary medicine. And they go in the vulva or under the tongue. And this was a huge paradigm for Detloff to jump over. I had a cow with a huge utter edema, and I was putting her on apis mel. Homeopathy is a treatment of like street likes. And so apis mel is the Latin word for apis mel effecta is the bee. And what does the bee cause? Swelling with bee venom. And so, but homeopathy, all I can say is you have to, you have to walk the walk to know that it works. Very, very useful tool. These two items are not very expensive. Essential oils. Essential oils are plant distillates that are usually highly energetic. Uh, they are quite often antimicrobial. This was uh, this this whole area has been dropped or was dropped from veterinary medicine. We now have a resurgence and uh, a lot of work being done on essential oils as far as in your uh, fly control on your liniments, in your mastitis treatments. Uh, and this is an area that human medicine is going to have to go to to get some multi-leveled antibacterial products rather than having one molecule of penicillin or genicin and the bacteria learns how to make a new cell wall through mutation and it doesn't work anymore. And to get a, the, the best mousetrap for antibiotics is going to come out of here and it's going to be a natural plant from the Amazon or Peru or someplace that's going to be 15 layers of anti, antibacterial things that no, 
with no resistance. So, a uh, huge tool, a huge emerging tool. Aloe vera. I will preface aloe vera. Anytime I have a cow with a temperature of 103 to 106 that has an infection, when you have the insult on an animal's body, you will have cortisol rise. And this came out of Iowa State University, and the Impro company was seeing this in that there are two times when a cow has a depression in her immune system. And one is at calving, she'll take a seven-day slump, and it's all affected by the endocrine system that works on parts per trillion. And then the second time is that two weeks before calving and two weeks after calving, the cow's immune system takes a huge dump. When the cow freshens, she is in the toilet as far as immune capabilities to respond because of cortisol production. Aloe vera has the ability, it's an immune modulator. Aloe vera has the ability to negate the effects of cortisol from the endocrine system that shuts down the ability to kick out your T cells and your killer cells for fighting infection. So if I walk into a barn and I got a cow three days fresh and she's got a pneumonia, uh, mastitis, retained placenta, I know her immune, immune system is really struggling. If you put her on aloe vera, an ounce per 100 pounds, I'll take a 10-ounce drench, you will turn on the immune system. And then if you dump a tincture, I said there's a tincture for everything, echinacea. Michigan State University has done some research on echinacea. When you read that, it absolutely blows you away that, wow, what echinacea does to the T cells and the bone marrow, I mean, it is dramatic. And so I would take three cc's of echinacea tincture, stick it in my aloe vera drench, and I would drench that cow. Oh, and now I'll mention another thing, these tinctures. When I'm treating a really toxic cow with, a, with an infectious something in her body, I will dump my tincture in the IV. I will go IV with five cc's of garlic. I'm, over, I'm in overkill again. Uh, instead of three, I'll dump five cc's of a garlic tincture right in my IV. That's five ounces of alcohol. That's not, I got a brother-in-law that's got that much in him by now already, you know. <laughs> so that little 5 cc isn't going to bother her. Anyway, aloe vera is a huge tool, and, and it comes in a pellet form. There's three or four companies now that are making a very good aloe vera pellet. And what, Al, if you go home and you've got 10 calves coughing, we've got this nasty weather, we're going to drive through to get home here later today, and you know how many calves got stressed and got snowed on and the door flew open? And they all have a challenge. It may be a pasturella. It might be an IBR, but there's something there. I mean, the train was set up for these bugs to take off. And so rather than jump in the pan and rattle them up and give them all garlic or penicillin, you put some aloe vera pellets in front of them. Or I've used it many, many times where you move herds. In Organic Valley, we'll have 40 cows move from uh, Maine to a farmer in Ohio. It's a nine-hour truck trip. And they say, what do I do? I tell them I want those cows to go on seven ounces of aloe vera pellets three days before they leave the farm and keep them on for 14, 15 days through, until they're through the shipping fever complex. And it's kind of fun to watch these cows because you'll see these cows on these aloe vera pellets on about the fifth, sixth day they'll all have a discharge from their nose. And you wonder, wow, what's that? It's a clear, serious discharge. And then about the tenth day they'll all cough. But they're all eating, and what they're doing, you're watching the immune system work. And it's really, when you watch these things, it's really neat. Whey products, we'll cover that real quick. Uh, whey products, uh, the Impro company was a leader in that. My first experience with the whey was in 1967. I was a whippersnapper out of school. The fellow that sold whey products from Impro was a client of mine. His far home farm was in my practice, and he invited me to a meeting in Winona, Minnesota at the Holiday Inn. And I bought 24 bottles of Impro's First Way. And I used it conventionally as a Friday night special. I would be on a farm Friday or Saturday, and this cow would flare up with a mastitis. And the guy would say, Doc, I really wanted to sell her. She's a cull cow. She's got bad feet or this or that. In 67, we didn't know anything about somatic cell count. But anyway, and in fact, in 67, we didn't have to hold cattle for, uh, for antibiotics. When I started practice, I mean, I'm old. Combiotic. How many guys know what combiotic was? Penicillin, dihydrostreptomycin, and oil. 20 cc's of that. 14 months later, you could find dihydrostreptomycin in the kidney. We didn't worry about it. The worst bugger was chloramphenicol. That'll shut down your bone marrow. 
80% of the stuff that I started out with in my grip in 1967 to practice with is illegal today. That's scary. I killed a bull with chloramphenicol until I found out, they said, it shuts down the bone marrow. Boy, that got pulled off the market quick. I used DES like water, and every cow that had to read 10% in 67 and 68. Boy, the, the DES debacle was, was, was huge. Whey products have a really good place. But what I would do, this guy would say, hey, I'd say, don't treat this cow, don't, don't screw her up for slaughter. That was after, it was probably 68 or 9, we had to put a label on combiotic that you got to withhold them from slaughter. And so I'd grab this bottle of whey, and I'd grab this bottle of vitamin C, and I'd say, okay, Clyde, we're going to give her half a bottle today, you give her half a bottle tomorrow, and I'm going to give you this big bottle of vitamin C, we're going to drill her with half, and you give her half, and you sell her Tuesday, get her out of here before she dies. Three weeks later, I'd be there doing something. I'd look over. There that cow standing. I said, I thought you were going to sell that cow. Well, you know, by Thursday, by Tuesday, that cow kind of cleared up and she was milking 30 pounds, Doc. I'm going to get a little more out of her. I had that happen. It took me eight times to figure it out that it worked. But I had that happen about eight times and I said, there's something in this bottle. And so I became a proponent of whey real quick. And that, when I got into the organics, that was, uh, that was ready and waiting for me and I had, I knew how to use it. Botanicals, we'll cover that real quick. Botanicals are raw plant products that work just in their own paradigm. A real, two examples I'll give you is mullion leaf. Mullion is a plant that's a biannual. It has these basal leaves. Wherever you have road construction, it's the first thing that comes up. And these leaves have molecules in them that are huge expectorants. By an expectorant, I mean it'll bring fluid up from your lungs. It'll cause your, your you'll tear. You'll have your sinuses flush. When I'm working with, with uh, there's a product that we manufacture that has mullion leaf in it, and it's a tea with five plants that we make. Uh, it's a dry blend in a gallon jar, and we put a little muslin tea bag in there, and you brew this up, and you give it to a calf with, uh, you listen to this 300-pound calf, and he's got such moist lungs, just gurgling, and you want to get that out of there. We used to use antihistamines. Uh, most of those are no longer manufactured anymore. So this, this mullion leaf, it'll cause the modal cilia in your windpipe to speed up. And when you're mixing that up in a closed room, I'll get a sneezing jag, and I'll get my, my nozzle. It's a two-sleeve job. You just can't keep up. <laughs> so so there's, uh, mullion is a huge botanical. Uh, there's a whole list of them. We have botanical utter edema pills. We have botanical uterine pills. We have botanical respiratory. And, and this is an area that we're going to see more products come out in. Corporate in America is never going to go to any of these products because the tinctures, the... Uh, the uh, botanicals are not patentable. Corporate America cannot compete with the cottage industries. Most of these companies that are making these are little companies that are on the edge that have dug into a little niche that know a lot about tincturing and botanicals. And we're probably never going to see corporate America get a hold of these products. Vitamins and antioxidants, those are in, a, in the face of an infection. To, to summarize this quick... Uh, vitamin C, vitamin E, tinctured rose hips. There's a tincture for everything. When you tincture rose hips, you have a huge antioxidant. And what an antioxidant does is it cleans up the protein in the bloodstream. If you have a mastitis or you have a pneumonia, you have cellular destruction in the alveoli in the lungs, you have dead bacteria, you have dead macrophages. And when you get a protein flush in the bloodstream, a cow will get a headache, she'll get nauseous, she'll go off feed. And when you load her up, and that's why Impro gave vitamin C with all their whey products. They found out that their whey products work better in the presence of a huge antioxidant. Highly unused because it's so cheap. Vitamin C is cheap. Nobody can make money on vitamin C, so we're not going to use it. Uh, we reintroduced it in the organic. Trace and macro elements. This is one of Detloff's favorite. Colloidal minerals. A mineral can come in an elemental form, a chelated form, and a colloidal form. An elemental form like mineral and... Uh, Calcium carbonate and dical is 10% absorbable in the gut. An element in a chelated form that covered either with a proteinate ring or carbonate ring is up to 40% absorbable in the gut. A colloidal mineral or a colloidal molecule means that it once lived. That's 98% available. When I hit these new farms that have got run-out soil, feeding acidotic rations, we have deprived trace elements in that cow. Our, our dairy world in America, and all you have to do to watch this, and I become a very cognizant, you watch the hair coat. 
You watch the hair coat on a girl and it reflects the trace elements in the soil on that farm. And I've got into reading hair, thanks to Mr. Fry right down here, uh, on reading the hair of a cow. I have a PowerPoint put together on that. And you can look at, walk through a herd, and you can say, this guy has got some really sick soil. I mean, it, it really, really correlates. And so I want to re... The first two things I do when I hit a pool, the biggest help I can give them to get on our truck is have them attack their soil and get some kelp. K-E-L-P. It's from the North Atlantic. It's from clean water. And it's a trace element cocktail that's 98% available. And then I throw in humates. I love humates. That is a colloidal cocktail with a little different profile. He has humic acids, fulvic acids. And you take a bunch of calves and you put them in a pen and you mob raise them on milk, whole milk, and you keep a pan of kelp in one corner and a pan of humates in one corner and you will have the shiniest calves you ever want to see when they're eight weeks of age. And you will have the... See, a bovine needs 92 elements. If you look on an elemental chart, there's 110 elements. You and I and a bovine need 92 of them. And they have to be in balance. And they're all pluses and minuses. And when you fill, I want my cows when they calve, this is really, really imperative for colostrum quality. I want all my dry cows in the Organic Valley Pool to be on free choice kelp and humates during the dry period to fill their warehouse. And if they get a little too much selenium or copper or zinc, they'll store it in their strided muscles. If it's a fat-soluble element or, a, or essential oil, kelp also has essential oils in it that we don't even talk about. Anything that's fat-soluble in that will go into the liver or the fat. And I'm in pretty good shape there. So I, I really push this. And it, it's fun to watch these herds. Uh, some of them will, will gorge. A lot of times you don't want to... I won't put a lot of guys on free-choice kelp because they give up. Because these cows will purge on it. And so I'll say mix it 50-50 with Redmond salt. And until they earn that right. You have to earn that right to free-choice kelp with a good soils program or you will feed a lot of kelp. Uh, the other time they'll eat a lot of kelp and minerals is if you've got hard water. When you get water over 17 grains, and this is something you want to watch... I ran into this in northern Minnesota. There's a hard water area. And I put a barn meeting on in this guy's barn, and his cows looked terrible. Their hair coats were pathetic, and he apologized. And he said, I'm feeding kelp, I'm feeding a mineral, and they're eating me out of house and home. He had 25 grains of hardness in his water, and what it does is that it, it upsets the osmolality of a cell. And so they're all mineral deficient. The pluses and minuses were screwed up from the hard water. He put a softener in, and within 48 hours, his cows quit eating kelp. Boom. It was, it's very interesting. So keep this water deal in mind. Probiotics, that we need uh, for the rumen. We probably need this more in conventional world, the world because everybody's acidotic and we, we're destroying all the microorganisms. Hydrogen peroxide, we see that. I like to plug this in where we've got a lot of iron in the water. And you've got iron bacteria. Uh, I've seen some great results. I do a little work with a poultry uh, operation in my hometown. And they flush every water line in every poultry building between flocks with hydrogen peroxide. And they'll leave it sit in the water line so that that newborn chick coming in will get purged with probably 200 to 300 parts per million of peroxide the first four or five days. And it'll cut down their cholebacillosis from the yolk sac markedly. Proceed. Okay. There are three times when these tools won't work. There are three times when conventional tools won't work. I happened to do consulting in uh, Wisconsin and the Midwest with, uh, with bigger herds that have crashed. And these three things are what I'm going to look for because their tools won't work. Why don't they work? All of these affect the immune system. And I like my organic farmers to crawl so deep into their ecosystem. Last night, Dr. Ryberg or somebody asked, how do you describe a farmer or a farm? I describe him as a man that crawls into his ecosystem and becomes part of Mother Nature. And that's what you have to do in the organic world. So acidosis, and this is a scourge of the conventional world. This is high grain feeding. The rumen is made for grasses and forages. It is made for grasses and forages not seeds. When our margins got, got slim in the 70s and we bought the neighbor's farm and started this expansion mode and you went and borrowed money, they invented the word cash flow. Never heard the word in America cash flow before 
1967. When, but when my client started buying the neighbor's farm and saying, we've got to go up to 50 cows and we've got to build a harvester, and we've got we to gotta go up to 42 pounds of milk per head per day to cash flow this. So those old 15 brown Swiss that were milking about 12,000 pounds of milk wouldn't cut it anymore. And so we're going to start AIing, and we're going to get these big uttered cows, and we're going to bring the feed to them and haul the manure away. We aren't going to graze them anymore. I saw that whole pendulum go. Uh, poor quality feed, total reflection of poor quality rundown soil. You know, when you think about farming in America, my farm that I'm on, my wife and I, was patented in 1868 by Ulysses S. Grant. And for about 100 years, farming, when you look at the soil, didn't change. Farming changed mechanical. Cyrus McCormick invented the reaper in 52, 1852. The next significant thing that was invented was the cream separator. The first plant for cream separators in Poughkeepsie, New York in 1895. The Swedes from De Laval came over and built a plant and then all the East Coast we had all these separators come. But I used to collect cream separators so I know the history. And that took farming out of subsistence agriculture. They could sell their cream to the butter plant in Grand Meadow, Minnesota, like my dad did, and he shipped the butter to Boston, Massachusetts, and sold it. My grandfather started getting a check every two weeks, and he no longer was a subsistence agricultural. Then we got uh, the tractor came along, and then the hay bind came along, and we got production increased mechanically, but we never played around with the soil. When I left my dad's farm in 1960, we had a two-row John Deere planter with starter fertilizer, and that was the only thing we did that was non-organic. We did not have a sprayer. The thistle and cockleburr programs were Paul and Noel, get the hoe and get out there and pull those cockleburrs. Uh, we didn't even have nice names like they name all these now. But we didn't screw up the soil. My dad's soil in 1960 was wonderful. I could be out there plowing with an L.A. case, and any place in the farm these blackbirds would come in and grab an earthworm. When we introduced the sides in agriculture, side, what does a side do? Kills cells. Pesticides, fungicides, herbicides, homicides, suicide, kills cells. Okay? <laughs> then we started beating up the soil. When you kill the microbiology in the soil, we have done agriculture and we cut, we have, now we have this no-till. I hunt Indian artifacts in my hilly area in Wisconsin. We have more soil erosion going on in western Wisconsin now than we've ever had in our life. We are losing our topsoil. It's a travesty of what we're doing. It's so dead. You might have all this organic matter on top, but you get a two-inch gully washing rain and it goes right through and there's, there's trenches and gullies all over our fields in western Wisconsin. Stray currents. We'll get into that. Proceed there. Here's how not to store corn silage. Corn silage is the scourge of conventional farming because nutritionists like to call this forage. It's not. It's half seeds and it's half poorly mineralized low bricks fodder. And we're dumping that into the rumen at 45 to 60 pounds per head per day. And then we founder them. Then your profiles, your volatile fatty acids flip from Acetic acid, propionic acid, to butyric acid. High butyric acid coming out of here. This wasn't compacted. It's rotten. Uh, this is how not to do it. Proceed. Here is laminitis. See this heifer? 900 pound heifer. This guy had more, normally his heifers are 1400. He is feeding this 900 pound heifer like he was feeding a 1400 pound. Scoop shovels of grain, of, of dried shell corn. This girl was getting 18 pounds of dried shell corn. All the corn silage you could eat. Nice little heifer. And I, I'm on herd health or any doc. He says, what's wrong with this girl? And she's standing like this. I said, she doesn't want to stand on any of her feet. And if you'd watch her a little bit, she was going like this on her hind feet. I mean, she didn't want to stand. I said, John, that cow won't be alive in six weeks. And boy, that's a head snapper. And she wasn't. He was toasting her with grain. She was probably on a 70-30 I like to be able to walk through a barn and you look at haylage, it's 65% moisture and you're feeding how many pounds? 45, well that's two-thirds water, so that's 30 pounds of water. You got 15 pounds. The way I treat corn silage is that seven and a half pounds of seeds and seven and a half pounds of poorly mineralized low bricks fodder. And she died. Here's a girl that's coming in with her second calf. I mean, look at her hooves. What happened in the rumen, acidosis during the transition in the rumen will show up on the hooves six months later. And they get all these petechia hemorrhages, these little, little hemorrhages from butyric acid in the rumen will cause petechia hemorrhages and it's called laminitis and founder. 
and she doesn't want to walk on her foot, so then they rock back on it, and then they get a big old heel. Acidosis causes hairy warts. Go ahead. We've got to move here. Here's a cow that died, calved. She made it to be about her fifth lactation, and I knew my herds. I knew my herds, and I drove in the driveway what their grain forage ratio was. And so I knew I had an acidotic cow here. Didn't respond to milk fever, and I said, I want to open her up. See this liver here? The edge of that liver is bulbous. And when you cut that open, it's yellow. The ruminitis set up by acidosis just killed all the papillae on her ruminal wall. Here's another cow. See this liver? It's just round and bulbous. Liver should be come to a point. Whenever I would do a DA surgery on an acidotic farm, on the left side, I'd reach over on the right side to feel the liver. And if I felt the liver like that, I knew I had a problem in her recovery. Because she's got fatty infiltration of her hepatic cells. She has re, re, reduced liver function. And you better put her on burdock root. Is a tincture for everything? Burdock root, long term, will help remove fat from the hepatic cells of the liver. Proceed. Okay, poor quality feed is coming from poor mineral depleted soils. Next slide. I tell my farmers, your goal, the price of corn and soybeans because of ethanol and poultry has tripled in the last five years in the organic world and poultry needs corn and soybeans. They can't go to the alternatives. I'm telling all of our producers, you learn how to go to the small grains, but you have to, lear is to learn how to grow. They are so sick of hearing me, but they got a, a, a solid stemmed, highly mineralized, high bricks, grass, or hay. And when you do this, in this solid stem, in this bricks, B-R-I-X, and this here we're talking reams again, when you do this, you don't need a lot of grain. And we do have people on the Organic Valley truck that feed little or no grain. But they will fail if they have not had a good soils program. And I'm not going to tell any of our incoming clients to cut out your grain altogether because they can't produce this and they will, their cows will crash. When they start peaking, they'll be so out of energy that they won't peak, they'll get skinny, and they won't breed back. So I have to be cautious with this statement. And when I tell guys that the rumen is made for grass, if some guy's feeding 20 pounds of corn silage or 30 pounds of corn, 20 pounds of corn silage on a, on a dry, on an as-fed basis with not a lot of grain is still a good source of energy. I'm not saying don't use corn silage. I'm saying use it judiciously. Don't get greedy. So this is really here. This guy, this is some soil. When I was working with Midwest BioAg, we were correcting the soils by the Elbrecht system here. And we got these big old alfalfa leaves as big as a quarter to a half dollar. And I had these guys using a refractometer. It didn't take them long to figure out they didn't want to cut their hay till 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock. I had more fun with my refractometer in my, in my glove compartment. When some guy was heading out of the driveway at 7 in the morning with a hay bind, I'd say, where are you going? And after 30-some years, you get to know your clients pretty well. And I said, park that Hummer. Get in my pickup. And I would go out and I'd say, where are you going to cut this hay? And he'd say, we're out here. And so I'd go out of here and I'd take my little old Leatherman and we'd squeeze some juice on this. And I'd say, look at this. And he'd look at it and he'd say, what is it? It's five. Dr. Scow taught me that we want 12 bricks forage. When you get 12 bricks forage, you got dynamite. I, and I'd leave my refractometer and I'd say, why don't you come out here at 11 o'clock and check it? And then come out at 2. And they'd watch it go from 5 to 7 to 9. You just doubled your sugar content. That's palatability, that's energy. Next slide. These guys were so happy. Okay, a total soils program, and I'm just a cowboy veterinarian. I don't know all this stuff, but it looks to me like you've got to have your dry blend, your Elbrex, and your base saturation, your cations, and your pH liner out, and then that promotes microbiology. And you can do that with humates and a whole lot of... And then your trace elements come in, and then you come in and you throw the Reams program in here, and you do some foliar, and when you start doing all these three, boy, you got a good program. And here is a cow patty right here that has been here less than two weeks in this pasture. This is a microbiological filled pasture. And that cow patty is gone. The microbes ate it up. Now we have humus. Now we have something that will hold water. When you get into here, you start getting tilth back in your soil. High magnesium takes the air out of soil. No microbiology takes the air out of the soil. 25% of the soil should be air, and that's tilth, and you get an aggregate. And when you get these organic farms, and it's, and, and it's just been fun for me to watch these guys transition in, they become soils of the, stewards of the soil. Next one. Here's a nice herd of grazing cows that I went out. I was doing some work uh, 
this fall was reading the hare. And this is a highly mineralized herd. The other thing we'd notice when we'd get my clients on a soils program and back off from the feeding and back down, my wife would get really mad at me because we had six kids. We would lose 80% of their vet business in about two years. Didn't we, dear? I'd come home and I'd say, so and so is going to go organic. And the first, she did all my, she's my rock, she did all my books. And I'd say, well, Myron's going to go organic. And she'd say, oh my gosh, Myron's a $6,000 account. <laughs> and within 18 months, uh, this guy, I could hardly squeeze a thousand out of him. I'd wave at him and drop off aloe when I went by. But it made him a better farmer. Next slide. Okay, stray currents. I don't know why, but in my group practice and around, I got involved in litigation seven times. And when you go sit and are deposed in front of a judge with some guy from Chicago that's making a half a million dollars working for the co-op, you better know what you're talking about. So I rounded up a couple experts on stray voltage and I sort of got educated. Here's your sources of currents, and I do have a PowerPoint on this. Geopathic currents. What are geopathic currents? Those are earth currents. Our earth is a iron ball, iron nickel ball. It's like our, our, so the core of our earth is like a magnetized ball bearing. And magnetized means energy. And so our crust of the earth contains 110 elements. All current runs through the crust of the earth by Ohm's law, the path of least resistance. And so we have ley lines. Uh, we, have that we have grid energies. What are grid energies? Our electrical distribution system in the United States is called the open delta system of electrical. And we use the ground as a return for the currents back to our substations. It's the way our whole grid is lined up. And so every power pole is grounded. And that electricity goes back through Ohm's law. Now, if you're sitting on some high... CEC soil that's a little wet, boy, you have got a conductor. If you're sitting on some low CEC soil that's blow sand that's not wet, you're not going to have... So if your farm's kind of on the edge of a peat bog or if you're on a heavy clay knoll uh, and your substation, I mean, it gets to be really kind of interesting. Cosmic energy we don't pay any attention to. All we know is that cosmic energy is coming out of the, out of the sky and has been deciphered that this is coming from supernovas. This is just recent, in the last few years. Supernovas, which are mini Big Bangs, the, most, the one that was studied the most happened in 1020 A.D. The Chinese observed it, and it's called Crab Nebulae. Anybody heard of Crab Nebulae? We still have negative energies, negative energies coming from Crab Nebulae. On Orion's belt, they expect that there will be a supernova develop within the next... There's, every 15 years in the Milky Way, we have a, uh, a supernova. And we don't know what these do. They penetrate as far as they can go in the diamond mines of Johannesburg, South Africa, the deepest hole we have in this earth, they can, they're still going. Uh, cell phones, radio towers, these are all in the air. Gas pipelines all have a cathodic charge. Position of the sun, earth, and moon. I mean, we, when we send the, we delayed this space probe today, uh, we go so long and these ch change in the gravitational pull and the uh, energies we can't, there's only certain times when these are lined up we can shoot a spacecraft off. Next slide. Uh, our electricity comes from these big power plants, two coal plants along the Mississippi, and they transmit, go ahead, the electricity to major substations by Blair, Wisconsin, by me. This is a biggie. This is like 161 kilovolt substation on the lines going here. And what they have to do is they got to reduce this current down to where you can use it at a plug-in. Here's a little substation. I watched this substation be built. I had a current problem develop on a group of farmers because Arcadia, Wisconsin, all of a sudden became an industrial town with Ashley Furniture and Golden Plump. So the substation that was servicing Arcadia and Independence game too, became too small. So they said, we're going to feed Independence off the Whitehall substation, 10 miles away. The line going from Whitehall to Independence was too small. And so all of a sudden, I had three herds that just crashed. I couldn't hardly pregnancy check them. It was like sticking your hand in a well pipe. I'd be doing it lockups. I'd get kicked. Everything I treated died. And both these herds flipped like that. And I got a hold of an electrical expert. And he said, well, you know why? And I said, no, I don't know why. He said, that's because they're using this line here as a feeding to independence. And it was overloaded. And so they, so they put this new substation in. They graded this off. And they drove ground rods in the ground. 
great big 24-foot ground rods. I went by there one day and it was like hair on the dog sticking up. Then they got big orange trucks of rock salt and put rock salt. They created, an it's like ionization of the soil. They created a little battery here because all the electricity is coming back to the substation. Proceed. Uh, all poles are grounded. This happens to be a steel pole. I live seven miles from Arcadia and they end right across from our driveway. This is the, uh, the uh, Arcadia has gotten to be such a huge electrical user with Ashley Furniture. They got 2,000 people and they all are running a motor. So the neutrals, the grounds are getting too hot for our little town of 2,500. So they are using seven miles of steel poles as a grounding system out my way as the, as the, uh, the grounding for city of Arcadia. You can't cut the ground rods on these Hummers. <laughs> Go ahead. Here, what I want to see on every farm is a, is a, a 37.5. This is a transformer at the farm. Here in South Dakota, I made a little tour to some of our organic valley. I was on 12 organic valley farms and four of them had stray voltage. Just when I drove in the yard and looked around, I said, you got a problem. Here is a little 15 kV transformer and it's undersized so they run hot and they get rusty. When you go home, look at your transformer and they'll usually have a number on them. And this was 15 kV, and that was running so hot, they had current problems in this farm. They kind of suspected it. So we did, a, we did a service update. Next slide. Next slide. Here's a capacitor. Be aware of these. They usually, here's three of them in Colorado, three of them in, uh, in Wisconsin. There'll be three of them in a row. This is what they put on this line between Whitehall and Independence, and what these are, capacitors are electron storage units. And so when you see these, you will have a high energy user someplace so that when peak demand hits, this, this puts energy into the line. They put a little sawmill up about three miles from me, and it wasn't two weeks after they put this sawmill in, a, a capacitor went up right on the pole, right across from the road from them. They needed more energy. The problem is with capacitors in non-peak times, they get full and they'll pump extra electricity into the ground. So at two in the morning, if you got a, if you got a meter hooked up in your barn and you're on a stray voltage, if you got working with something, a lot of times you'll see these spikes in the middle of the night. That's because you got a capacitor dumping, capacitor dumping. Here's a rusty transformer with a capacitor right by it. Now, you just call your electric co-op and you say, I would like a service update. On these farms in Millbank, South Dakota, I hit, I just wrote down, here's what you do. You call us, you say, I want a service update, and you tell them the consultant from Organic Valley does not like what he sees in your yard on electricity. First thing they'll do is they'll say, who's that idiot? I tell them, never tell them I'm a veterinarian, because that's really out of the box. You say, I'm a consultant, and they'll complain about it, but they know that they have got a problem, and they will change that. Next slide. Here's how you check for grid energies. You learn how to douse. You learn how to douse. You get yourself... Uh, Acres has a very good book, Dousing for Beginners, laying right on this table out here. That was my primer that I started reading. You douse for negative energies affecting the cows in this barn. Then it can be... Is it a ley line? Nope. Is it underground water? Yep. How deep? 10 feet? 20 feet? 30 feet? 40 feet? 50 feet. Boom. You got underground water. 50 feet under the barn. Which way is it going? Boom. I don't even know how it works. It just does. I'm dousing. See this calf here? He's drinking urine and mud. I'm on this herd. The third hutch in, she said, I have never kept the calf alive in that hutch. All 18 hutches, I never treat a calf. These calves die. Good gal. Really knows how to raise calves. I doused it. Negative energy. We moved that calf. I said, quit treating it. She went to feeding it three times. Six weeks later, that calf caught up. Next slide. Here's a typical thing. See this girl head pressing? This guy's got a 175 kilovolt large transmission line going over the corner of his barn. Uh, dancing. They'll dance. This girl stands way over. Here's a calf that's dying. Go, uh, see this? Watch your cats. Cats are the only species that love to lay in a crossing. If you've got a cat laying in a stall consistently and you've got problems in that stall with your health, your cows, you better get your rods out and douse it. Because you've got either a ley line, a Hartman line, curry lines, or underground water moving. 
uh, fluorescent lights have an electromagnetic field around them. And what I see in Organic Valley is that you'll have these beautiful little swing parlors built and the cow's standing way up and they really want it lighted. So they put a new metal ceiling in. This is a client of mine and I told him, I said, he just remodeled this this summer and I said, use incandescent bulbs, don't go with, with fluorescence. And he's got them all covered with glass. I mean, I, was, I took this picture. Here's a barn with a big old bulbs. You've got an electromagnetic field. If you're in a parlor and that cow's standing way up here, I've seen fluorescent lights 8, 10 inches above their back. And while they're in there milking, they're getting zapped. Next slide. Uh, transformer right next to the barn. No, no, a no, no. That baby's grounded. And you've got re-rod. And you've got all these pipelines. And you've got a telephone. Don't ever... Don't ever ground your telephone line. You, you got this metal roof. Uh, next slide. Get that. Get a service up there. Get that across the road. The old Romax. How many guys got this old Romax? And they put in initially. Romax. If you leave it in the barn, even though it's unconnected, it'll carry a half a volt of energy. Okay. We're done. Go to the next slide. <laughs> Cell tower. Next slide. Never put a water line under your electric fence. Here. Thank you. Oh, gas lines. Gas lines all have a cathodic charge on them. And when they come out of the ground here to have a shutoff valve, that's a bad spot to be by. I've got a whole PowerPoint. Thank you. I'm supposed to be done. <laughs> Again, that was Dr. Paul Detlaw from 2007 with his talk, Enhancing Vet Tools. You can order his new book from us, and if you are an email newsletter subscriber, look for special deals as we promote this book this summer. Uh, again, it's called Raising Animals Organically. Uh, it's, it's a fantastic book. Thank you for listening. Catch Dr. Paul at our conference in Minneapolis this year. Our next episode will be with the soil expert, Glenn Rabenberg, who travels the world to help bring soil back to the way nature intended. I'm excited for that one. He's going to be out of California with us this year at our Healthy Soil Summit as well. So it'll be a good preview for you guys who are on the fence, not sure if you want to go or not. Listen, and I guarantee you'll want to go after you hear him on the podcast. So thanks again for everybody listening. Uh, have a great rest of your week.